Oops. Okay. Um, hi, hello, my name is uh, Joseph Bush and I'll be the moderator for this session. Um, welcome to um, the panel uh, titled Why AI is Not Equal to Automated Indexing, um, What Is and Is Not Possible. Um, we're gonna be um, talking for the next couple of hours um, or the panel will be talking over the next couple of hours um, about, um, about artificial intelligence and automated indexing um, and trying to parse out those concepts uh, first and foremost, um, and then talk about some of the challenges um, of, uh, that we face because we have a large scale amounts of digital content um, that is swimming all around us. Um, and we have uh, lots of technologies that are taking advantage of being able to um, process through those large amounts of content. Um, uh, but there are um, you know, certain issues that arise about the nature of what comes out of processing all that content. Um, and just because it's available uh, or it's popular may not mean that it's the best or most appropriate material, especially when we look at the subject domains that are more specifically scoped than what might be broadly available out there. Um, so we have a, a, a wonderful panel of, uh, of people that we've gathered together who, who represent a number of different areas of, uh, of, of domain expertise um, and um, technical expertise. Um, the domains cover research data, um, art history, and scientific publishing. And the domains range from um, computational linguists, uh, linguistics um, through deep um, experience with uh, libraries, archives, and museums at all at all levels and and sizes. Um, so, um, I want to just give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of information about the panel, so that we don't, um, so I don't have to intervene a whole lot in the in the process. Um, uh, so, just very quickly, um, the speakers are going to talk first in the order in which they appear in the program. Um, so I'll introduce them in that order. First will be Hans Brandhorst, um, who's an independent art historian and the editor of Icon Class System and, and Archives. I've known Hans for a really long time and he is absolutely brilliant in this area and has many important and interesting things to, uh, to tell us. Um, the second um, presentation will be by uh, Quim More Lopez um, and he'll be joined by uh, Maria Cristina Marinescu, who are both at the um, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And, uh, and Quim is a senior researcher and expert in computational linguistics. And um, they'll be talking um, about some work they've been doing with um, uh, automated um, recognition of, uh, of images. So uh, interesting compliment to the icon class presentation that Hans will be giving first. Um, and they'll be followed by Margie Lava, um, who um, is also an old friend of mine, so I've known her for a long time. Um, but I'll introduce her as the developer of Data Harmony software, um, which is a suite of tools that are used to, um, to process um, information, particularly uh, scholarly publications in, in different domains. Um, and it's also intended to be a tool to help that particular publishing process. She has expertise in many, many areas and has uh, uh, been involved with really important information science approaches to this, including uh, being very active in various related standards. Um, and then our next speaker will be Ming Fang Wu who's at the Australian Research Data Commons or ARDC, since it's a kind of a long, um, 
um, the name of an institution, couldn't fit it on the slide, but it's the Australian Research Data Commons, and, and she's a senior research and data specialist. Um, I think it's really interesting when we look at data sets um, and how we handle data sets. Um, and I, in my opinion, it, we're still very immature in the way that we handle them and describe them and process them and ultimately use and reuse them. And Ming Feng has some interesting perspectives on that. And then uh, last but not least is, is Asma Swaminen. Um, sorry I'm for pronouncing your name poorly. Um, and um, Asma is an information systems specialist at the National Library of Finland. And I've, I've met Asma at Dublin Core meetings and um, he has a perspective that's perhaps more related to, to linked data. Um, I'll let the um, presenters tell you anything more that they like to about their background, although their presentations will speak for themselves. So after my brief introduction, we'll have five presentations. That'll be about 10 minutes each. Um, and um, then we'll take a five minute break um, since we have a longer session than some of the other Dublin Core sessions have been. And then we're going to have a kind of deeper panel discussion, at which point um, we'll also take uh, questions from the, um, from the audience that's out there. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat as we go along, especially in the, the first section, in the uh, second section after the break. Um, we'll be a little bit more free, freewheeling. You can raise, raise your hand or type in the chat. And we also have some topics that we've prepared for discussion as well um, so that we can move beyond the talking heads and do a little bit more interactive. Um, so we're very excited to um, uh, mm -hmm. have this, uh, this session and I will um, stop there, uh, stop sharing my screen. And I will turn this over to our first presenter, which will be Hans Brandhorst. So Hans, go ahead and share your screen and we look forward to your talk. Okay. Uh, just to illustrate how brilliant I am with pictures, I just noticed I sent you a mirror image of myself for, for your little listing. So some nuances are in order there, I guess. Um, I've uh, taken the liberty of adapting uh, a, a short presentation, Etienne Posthumus, the uh, programmer of Icon Class, uh, delivered uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, one and a half week ago, and uh, adapted it to this meeting because um, it's not about blindfolding or death by beheading, but uh, it is about classification and interpretation, form and meaning. Um, Etienne talked about a new release of the uh, Icon Class um, uh, system, which is which he is working on at present, and I think it was it's relevant for this meeting as well. That's why I sort of summarize what he said. Um, it's it's been over ten years uh, since the last major update, update. and. Um, we are planning to do an update before the end of this year. The, the last significant change again uh, programmed for the Icon Class uh, system, which is online, was his uh, addition of the linked open data um, possibility back in 2015, which is six years ago. And as he said, the focus of the new release is improving the user experience. And uh, at the same time as we are working on this uh, Icon Class um, uh, reboot, actually, um, we are also have started a foundation, the Henri van der Waal Foundation, um, which is has as its focus uh, to stimulate um, iconographic research and especially iconographic research helped by computing. So that's a, a little background for the, uh, the new release of the Icon Class uh, system. These are a few of the highlights uh, HN um, selected. Um, they will be in the, in the presentation for you to look at them later on. Um, very recently, that that's, uh, was a very relevant one. Uh, we received news from Tokyo 
where a complete Japanese translation of Iconclass was created without us knowing it. And they, um, they offered us to, uh, to add that to the Iconclass uh, system, which it'll incorporate in, in, in the next uh, few months. The rest, uh, just have a look at them yourself later on. These are some of the buzzwords. Um, some of them I understand, some of them I just don't understand, but the most important buzzword, which I Jen focused on and which I uh, intend to talk a, bit, a little bit more about now is images. Um, everyone who has ever looked at the Icon Class site in the past 10 years has noticed at some point there were images and in other, at other times we had to remove the images for basically for technical reasons. But images will be added in a variety of ways to the, uh, the new uh, version of Icon Class, um, partly because of the IIIF uh, uh, sort of uh, ecosystem that has been created over the past few years. It didn't exist five to 10 years ago. So we're trying, we'll, we'll try to make the most of IIIF resources and also to allow users to um, import their own collections to the Icon Class uh, system. So the Icon Class system will definitely be, at least will incorporate an illustrated uh, Icon Class. And that's what I wanted to talk about because one of the issues we've been looking at uh, very intensely over the past two or three years is the question of whether an Icon, illustrated Icon Class can play a role in the automation of image indexing. And if so, just how. When we talk about the automation of image indexing, I, and, and that's something we will be talking about in the second hour, I'm, I'm sure, we have to hammer out what the ambitions and the goals are of automated image indexing and um, what the challenges will be. Um, this is um, from, a, from another uh, lecture I did last December in Luxembourg. And there I asked, are we expecting algorithms to identify these meanings of sleeping lions? And there, there's a whole world of lion imagery in the uh, Middle Ages and early modern era. And uh, that's quite a threshold to get over. Or um, to distinguish those lions, sleeping lions that are actually symbols for rulers and kings with a, a lot of other meanings that uh, lions in those uh, periods can signify. And there are, there are many, and this is just a short um, selection from the meanings a lion, the image of a lion can have. Are we expecting or hoping that um, algorithms will be able to distinguish all these meanings? I'm asking the question, I don't have an answer. Um, or should algorithms identify common meaning? Like what all of these little images mean is the Festina Lente theme of slow haste, but they are shaped in various forms. They express the same idea in a, in a wild variety of forms. This is just another eight or seven pictures of a, of a possible 60 or 70 different uh, um, expressions, different iconographies for the same meaning. If we create a test set, and I'll, I'll show a few examples of that, what should it, uh, how should it help us, and what should it help us teach the machine to identify forms, identify meaning, or both? And um, a, a text, a test set was put online by uh, HN again with almost 90,000 uh, pictures in a, a huge Metabotnik. You can go, uh, I'll, I'll um, well, here you can see the URL. You can go there yourself and have a look at them. Um, this is a little zoomed in uh, version of the same uh, bitmap, extremely rich bitmap with the 90,000. Um, 500 pixels to the longest side of each, each picture. And it's a random selection of a far larger set of about a million images, all of which have been classified with icon class notations. If we go back one, 
all of those pictures, like I said, have been classified, as you can see at the bottom here, with some eigenclass notations. But those eigenclass notations are all linked to the complete image. So just an example, and that's one of the reasons I selected blindfolds. Exactly where is the blindfold in the bitmap? We can tag the whole image with this eigenclass notation, but the, the question still remains where the blindfold actually is. Where in the bitmap? What are the coordinates of the, of the blindfold? And doesn't seem very important, but if you, if you have a look at, at the rich harvest from the Middle Ages and early modern era of pictures where a blindfold is shown and the meaning of that blindfold, then it's, it's quite substantial. Um, for those of you who still read some Latin here, it says, Jesus deridetur velatis oculis, Jesus is mocked with his eyes covered. So there are many instances where Christ, uh, when he is mocked, is shown with a blindfold. And of course, a lot of pictures, we have endless amounts of pictures of executions, unfortunately, where the, uh, the victim is blindfolded. And of course, there's love blindfolded and there's also fortune that's blindfolded. So there are many different shades of meaning attached to the blindfold. And this is a little example of the, the test set um, where you can see the icon class notation here in the red circle and the different languages that are composing the bag of words that is linked to an image if this little hiking class code is used in a database. And this is just a small selection or small listing of all of the, the keywords that are also linked to any picture that has this hiking class notation. So it's a quite a rich bag of words. Um, and then the, the question is, why is this important? Blindfold, okay, that's, a, that's quite a, a, a significant iconographic element, but on a more um, practical level, can we automate indexing a detail like this detail, the raised hand? And if you ask yourself, why is that important? And what would it help indexes if we could somehow automate that? Just have a look at the index of medieval art. There are over a thousand, 10,000 records, sorry, many more than 10,000 because they have a limit of 10,000 uh, hits when you retrieve something. So if you query for hand raised, you can see many of those descriptions of all those pictures have hand raised in them. And that's, like I said, well over 10,000 of those images have been described manually, of course, over the past 100 years by catalogers and indexes who sweated over these images. and. Uh, manually typed hand raised over and over and over again. So if that would be our ambition, which is a much, much more modest ambition, and then that's my final sort of rhetorical question. Should we, can we create a library of patterns? Um, and one of the ambitions we have is indeed to integrate that with icon class. And these are just some samples of the, the, um, the little iconographic details that can be linked to those uh, icon class concepts and therefore to a, a wealth of, um, of uh, keywords which which to retrieve them. And um, like I said, um, there's some useful addresses where you can contact us and ask questions and have a look at those, uh, some of those uh, things yourself at the icon class and Metabot and the, the uh, lab uh, I can class test set. So that's uh, that's it for me so far. <laughs> Great, thank you, Hans. So um, let's go on to our our second talk, um, which will be um, uh, Quim and Maria Cristina. I think you can share your screen, and it will take over the screen. Yep. Okay. Great. 
Perfect. Can you see me here? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes we can. <laughs> so, well, uh, our talk uh, from the BSC, National Center Computing Center, will be about the work we have done on the <clears throat> St. George and Pi project. And uh, <clears throat> I give the floor to Maria Cristina to explain more or less the project and the general introduction. And then uh, what is the, the, the motivation, motivation, please? So, Maria, if you want to start. Yes, um, uh, thank you. Would you mind going to the next slide? I'm sorry, it, it's complicated if we have two sets of slides. So, could you advance, Kim? Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, um, we are a lot less ambitious than Hans. Um, we initially wanted to be more ambitious and we realized how hard the problem is. So what we wanted to do is to uh, be able to generate automatically um, captions, descriptions of uh, paintings and to be able to eventually capture, you know, symbols and, and things like that. Uh, meanwhile, we realized, as I said, that, that there, are very, uh, there are not very many um, good descriptions that could be aligned with paintings so we can uh, apply deep learning algorithms over them and generate descriptions for new paintings. Uh, so what we're, what we're doing here is uh, basically, well, as Kim will explain, we're doing several things. We're generating uh, semantic labels for objects in, in paintings using automated deep learning algorithms. Uh, we are refining these labels and uh, generating candidate relationships between the objects using natural language uh, models, uh, language models for English in this case. Um, and we are, I'm not sure how much time Kim will have to explain this, but we were, we were also trying to extract automatically from existing descriptions, those uh, fragments, descriptions are large and, and they talk about a lot more stuff than just what it is in a painting. So we're trying to automate the process of extracting only what it is about the painting. And um, uh, finally, we are at the point of starting to uh, to leverage uh, crowdsourcing as well, because uh, in some cases it's it's impossible to generate uh, good semantic labels for the relationship within between objects without uh, manual help. So, uh, Kim, I'm not sure whether Kim, yeah, um, Kim, do you want to yeah. okay. take it from here? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so well, I will continue. <clears throat> With the artificial intelligence issues we have faced for cultural heritage, one of the most important issue is how to um, detect uh, from artificial intelligence uh, imaginary beings like angels and uh, how to detect anachronisms. We have to remember that uh, current uh, images, the descriptors are trained with photographs and of course there are no photographs of angels and um, and there are a lot of photographs of uh, people holding cell phones so these uh, systems are trained with images of of people and persons men and cell phones but of course we cannot detect a cell phone uh, as, an, as an object from the painting in the 15th or 16th century. And uh, of course, uh, the imagery being angel is not uh, detected because uh, this kind of entity is not found in the, tra in the training data sets. So, <clears throat> another, another issue is that uh, the, the training data, uh, all the, um, the person, well, the human beings are labeled as person but of course when we have this uh, painting and we, we see a person who's wearing a meter uh, we expect that this uh, entity is labeled as bishop not not a person and meter as the two things to separate things we would like to um, to provide a more specific uh, a more specific class so <clears throat> 
what are the challenges we face when we try to to train a painting uh, to, to, to train a, a painting class detector so one of the issues is that some classes are represented only in a few in images they are classes in, in paintings that, that they are not in enough uh, uh, enough paintings and images to train a neural network to to uh, to detect these images we have to take into account the style medium color that may differ significantly between artists and uh, and we have not so many paintings and can produce them when needed so this is one of the problems and the current uh, descriptors are trained with millions and millions of images but uh, here in that case with cultural heritage we don't have so well, so great amount of of uh, data <clears throat> on the other hand uh, we also have to take into account that uh, in paintings uh, from the 12th century to uh, up to 18th century of course there are many images that uh, re represent uh, violent scenes people killing uh, other people and of course this kind of uh, scenes this kind of actions are not uh, are not depicted in photographs so um, current uh, imagery image uh, descriptors are not able to 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 detect this kind of violent uh, actions so and they are very frequent in paintings so this is another issue we have to we have to face so well this is more or less that in the, the workflow of how we um, detect on the one hand an angel instead of a person and uh, how do we prevent uh, the, the objects held by the version and uh, not as a cell phone but as a book uh, in that in that uh, workflow we have to take into account that we have um, the training data uh, from a Cocoa data set, which is the, um, the data set uh, with a lot of photographs, so uh, in, in, with many cell phones and things. And although, uh, and we have added also paintings from WikiArt, Icon Glass, and Wikimedia Commons. So, uh, this, uh, this um, data is provided to the, to the neural network and of course the neural network uh, suggests uh, an entity and the, 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 su the suggestion is filtered by what is called the time matrix which is for instance if, if the, 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 the entity detected is a cell phone the time matrix uh, says no this is not, uh, this is not, not fit the, the, the time so we have to look for another uh, predicted uh, class which is in that case uh, a book and from the paintings we are uh, from the painting data set we are able to detect angels as you can see here but um, <clears throat> uh, one of the issues we also have is that as i said before is that we don't have uh, enough uh, data for the ne uh, neural network to detect, for instance, a queen or a queen or, or a rider. So in that case, um, uh, uh, a way to overcome this limitation that we don't have so many instances uh, to train the system, we use a, a, a language model. So if a person is detected and a crown is detected, so we can infer that, and, and we and we know that this uh, this person is wearing a crown. We can infer that it's a queen, it's a king or a queen, or a person riding a horse is a rider. So in that case, uh, thanks to the language model, the person is replaced by king or queen. Or in that case, as you see in the, in the example, a person with a sword can be uh, inferred from the language model that a per person with a sword is a warrior. And then instead a warrior is replaced, uh, replaces sorry, a person, and then a person uh, on a horse is a knight, and then we can uh, refine. And in that case, you, we don't need or we wouldn't uh, train with thousands and thousands and thousands of paintings of knights. Uh, this class can be inferred from the language model. So, 
in, in, if we go further, we can see that a warrior, a warrior with a sword and a dragon can be a hero. And this, uh, this class, this, uh, this class that, that has been inferred from the language model, can be, uh, can be added to the icon class as a, as a class by itself. But uh, Siegfried, for instance, can, uh, can be under this, uh, under this class. So Siegfried could be uh, taken as a, as a sort of hero in that case. So, um, for, for um, training the, the system, we need, we need to compare the image with the text, with text that describe the image. And, uh, and we have, uh, we have uh, collected this text that uh, describe images from, by you see, uh, 15,003 paintings with, um, with uh, that are, we have a uh, good resolution in, uh, for working with small images, and and they have been scrapped, and we have uh, collected this huge or this in database, and one the characteristic of the the, the, the text that uh, accompany the images and describe the image is that many of the sentences of the description of the painting are not referring to the content of the image. Notice that uh, here that this is the, the, the description of the pa this painting and we have marked the sentences that refer to the content. All the other sentences refer to the biography of the, of the painter, the, the, time, the, the philosophical meaning, or well, and, another uh, subject. So what we have to do is uh, in order to get sentences that describe the pain, the painting in order to uh, collect the training corpora for the nature and the, for the neural network, we have to uh, to create a sentence a descriptive sentence classifier that from this text, uh, identifies the sentences that refer to the content of the painting. But notice that, that this is the first of trial, so the F1 score was not uh, very good. So we had to, uh, to um, perform a paper testing the description sentence because most of the sentences were not detected as descriptive because the, the entities referred are not in the in the, in the uh, canonical captions as we have here. So, for instance, in canonical captions from Coco Data Set, Christ is not, uh, does not appear. So, but if we, we replace Christ for, with person, then this can, is detected as a descriptive. For instance, Christ uh, carrying the cross is not classified as descriptive, but if we substitute Christ with person, a person carrying the cross, it is, uh, it is a descriptive uh, sentence. And if we say view of the Golgotha, Golgotha is not uh, identified, but if we substitute Golgotha with mountain, then we have view of the mountain, and then this is classified as descriptive. And uh, another uh, point of view was uh, how to detect the verbs that refer to things depicted in the painting. Mm -hmm. So from icon, uh, from text, from, for instance, Museo Nacional del Prado, we have selected sentences that contain verbs, and then we see if the verb has a subject, which is a person or a physical object, or a complement, which is a person or a physical object. And we use the Wikipedia and WordNet, and we have seen if these verbs that have a, a person or a physical object are in the icon class. And for instance, we can see that from verbs like decapitated or where are verbs that are, are referring to a content in the painting, but verbs like think or believe are not. So, from this, we can infer uh, different classifications. For instance, for in icon class, if we query for decapitated people, we have no results, but 
uh, if we query decapitate, we have results and we have the person who is uh, who has been decapitated. So in that case, uh, we could um, we could infer from this, from the, the detection of these verbs and the subject and the object, we can infer classes like decapitated people, and we could get results like Asperius Cassius or Posthumus Tubertius son. And the same for, for instance, for instance, the dra dragon slayers, that we have the slayer dragon, and we have the subject and the object. So in that case, for instance, Siegfried could be uh, identified or labeled as a dragon slayer, for instance. And um, and the last uh, issue I would like to comment is when we want to uh, evaluate the. Um, the, the machine-generated uh, descriptions of a painting. If we use the metrics like blue or rouge, there is the, 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 met, the metrics is based on the matching between uh, uh, this reference description and the, the, the description generated by the machine. So imagine that the reference is Madonna with Christ as a child on her lap, and the system has generated St. Mary holding a child. Notice that uh, although um, it's quite it's quite good, there's n there's no matching, <laughs> or there's a little matching between between both uh, sentences. And and for instance, if we have as a reference Christ Pantocrator and Christ in Majesty, and then we have a man sitting on a chair and holding a book, and you see that the the matching is not uh, okay. It's, there's very few uh, words or engrams matching the, the reference, so the, the score would be low, but the, the, the descriptions are not, so, are not so bad as that. So well, that's all for my part, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Quim and Maria Cristina. Uh, very interesting stuff, and I'm sure we'll come back and be talking a lot more about it. So let's move on to our next speaker, who um, will be Margie Lava. Well, this is a little bit of a change of pace from the two talks we already had. Um, I was originally going to talk about um, some medical images and and identification kinds of things, but as we've already heard, these are um, problems. And what, we, uh, what I tend to do is work within text-based collections, text and, and conversions of PDFs to text. And so I wanted to talk about a more basic approach, which is whether AI is AI, or whether automatic indexing and artificial intelligence are congruent or not. Because I really think we have a definition problem. Um, it started for me when people started calling every knowledge organization system or classification system or whatever a taxonomy. And it seems to me nowadays they call taxonomy and thesaurus <clears throat> and um, ontology, they're using the words interchangeably. And as a, as a taxonomist and a wordsmith, that tends to drive me nuts. Um, it's the incorrect use of the terms, and, and uh, they're certainly not the same things. And I think that artificial intelligence and machine learning have a really similar problem. Um, so automatic indexing, also known as auto tagging, also known as automatic categorization or AutoCAD, um, is uh, defined within Wikipedia, at least, um, as a uh, computerized process of scanning large volumes of documents. And it says documents. So the talks we've heard so far about images, which I think is a, is a uh, difficult frontier, and I'm, I'm impressed with the work I've heard. Um, but it's to effectively tag or index large electronic repositories. And when I say large, I mean millions of documents, although certainly it can be used in thousands. Artificial intelligence, on the other hand, is to simulate human intelligence. Um, and there are lots of different um, methodologies used to do that. Um, 
it could be statistical, which is often an academic pursuit, the rules engines, um, which is the way that I pursue it, and other forms of intelligence. So natural language processing and computer vision, as well as uh, speech recognition and then object recognition like we just heard. But the main pieces of artificial intelligence are often linked to machine learning and the terms are used interchangeably. Um, I've read a lot of definitions where one is defined using the other, but to me, they're different. Machine learning, if you call artificial intelligence a domain, then machine learning is a subset of it because not all artificial intelligence is machine learning. Um, both tools um, often apply to uh, language processing and so forth, but the differences in how they are created and applied to workflows. So um, artificial intelligence, for example, does not necessarily need a training set. <clears throat> so I, of course, looked around to see what kinds of uh, stuff there was. And here's a uh, article that suggests that there's narrow AI and general AI. So that general AI is like automation, it can carry out a specific task that's repetitive and therefore can replace a human. Um, but general AI is, is flexible and would um, execute a, a lot of different tasks and, and perhaps be programmed so that it could teach itself. So two kinds of AI. Oh, but wait, here's three kinds of AI. So there's um, narrow AI, general AI, which we just looked at, and then artificial super intelligence, um, which would be something that's smarter than the human. Um, and, oh, but wait, there's seven types of AI, um, those on capabilities and those based on functionality. Um, and so the first ones that we looked at were the ones based on capabilities, but there's also ones that are based on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on um, functionality or, or how, uh, how the system is to be used in itself. Oh, but wait, there's even more. Here's 10 kinds of functional AI in that how are we imitating any particular kind of, a, of work? So can we automatically translate stuff um, like Google Translate does? Can we um, automatically generate peer-reviewed papers like SciGen or GPT does? Um, what about self-driving cars? Those are all functional AI. So it, it really becomes a uh, difficult methodology as people who work in metadata and classification to classify AI itself. To me, of course, the, the ideal of um, artificial intelligence was HAL, the computer in the movie, the 2001 Space Odyssey. But I have to wonder now if we were to cat catalog it today, would we call that machine learning or would we call it artificial intelligence? I'm not, I'm not really sure. And, and why do I worry about the definitions anyway? What's the fuss? Artificial intelligence is very comprehensible. It's easy for um, developers to understand why it's working. And rules engines use a lot of if then and Boolean statements to allow the developer to define exactly what the system is going to be doing. Um, and therefore it can support automated transactions, for example, um, as well as the automatic indexing of text. Machine learning, on the other hand, is purely statistical. Um, it can cover lots and lots of domains depending on who has it, um, but it's um, a method of data analysis that automates analytical model building. And um, if you look at what people are doing in climate change models, for example, this is part of the reason there's still so much debate is because they use heavily statistical means. And with a very small tweak, you can get a very, very different answer. Um, and, and the original models were flawed, but the more recent ones are good. Um, 
so if you think about machine learning as a collection of neurons, um, it's a um, it's a way that how do I get rid of this image? Sorry, there. Um, it it's a bunch of things that you could call any number of things, but they're frequently called neurons, um, and they learn um, through machine learning. And then they do the next one the same way. But if there's a little bit difference in the newest data or the training set, and you're not really aware of it, um, then new, uh, new directions are introduced. Um, and that may or may not cause bias in the system. It's very powerful, but no one truly understands once it's left to uh, its own devices to uh, exactly how it's coming to the conclusions. And therefore we get a lot of people talking about black boxes, for example. <coughs> so with these distinct differences in mind, um, machine learning is gonna limit a clear understanding of exactly how the system works. Artificial intelligence should be replicable, repeatable, and understandable. And it's really the use case where that makes you decide whether you want to use artificial intelligence or machine learning. And this um, graph shows a number of um, options for ways that we work on the on the different systems. You can have entity, entity extraction, weighting, syntactic analysis, semantic analysis, sentiment analysis, pragmatic analysis, pay attention to the grammar, have lemmatization or stemming, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on, morphological um, use of the term itself and it's the lexical variations, what are the synonyms? Part of speech tagging, sentence boundaries, punctuation, abbreviations, terminology extraction based on a um, uh, known list, uh, term weighting, co-occurrence, um, word parsing, phrase parsing, rule bases, and rules to increase accuracy and concept extraction. Um, or all of that can lead to concept extraction. So. Um, co-occurrence is an interesting one, as you can see over on this side of the stream, because it's um, it, it has a broad broad number of ways it can be applied. Um, so here's a little automated guy. Um, <clears throat> in my own system, there are things that um, I don't use because they're on more on the machine learning side and I can't replicate the results, such as neural nets, um, Bayesian statistics, vector analysis, and co-occurrence. Although I am using neural nets to detect uh, programmatically generated papers um, because they do follow a fairly distinct um, programming syntax. So if you take everything on the left-hand side and not this little circle over on the left, it's still, I think, automatic, uh, still artificial intelligence, and it's certainly all used in automatic indexing. So automatic indexing does use tools like artificial intelligence does. It uses rules and NLP and some machine learning, and depending on the system, it might use neural nets, depending on the applications. There's latent semantics. There's part of co-occurrence. Um, and other statistical means. It just depends on the system. So is AI, AI, artificial intelligence, automatic indexing, are they equal? Or is there not a clear enough de definition um, in, the, in the marketplace, in the industry? But at this point, given the loose use of terms, um, I think it's all marketing spin. You can call it what you want. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Margie. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's great. Lots of um, food for thought. And I think going back to first principles definitions is really important. And we'll have, you know, one of the kind of big areas is, you know, sort of the general 
definitions of these things. What the heck are we talking about? And also you're talking about use cases, which I think is a theme that's been coming up in all the presentations. So um, as time is uh, fleeting, so let's move along to the next presenter, uh, which is Ming Feng Wu. So I'll turn it over to you, Ming Feng. Uh, thanks. Uh, I prepared a recording because it's very uh, early here. Hi, everyone. My name is Ming Fang Wu from Australia Research Data Commons. Mm -hmm. uh, I will try to provide example of the discussed panel topic from the perspective of research data catalog. This example is automatically classifying data records using SRIC4 subject headings. Uh, SRIC4 stands for the Australia and the New Zealand Standard Research Classification for Fields of Research. First, I will provide a background of um, how SRIC4 is applied in a data catalog. Then I will introduce an example of automatic labeling or classification. So here is the background. Uh, there have been a growing number of data repositories and uh, catalogs uh, for publishing and uh, sharing data. And uh, the quality of metadata record from these repositories will greatly impact on the index quality and uh, ultimately that will impact on user search experience and the uh, interoperability among the data repositories. So one specific metadata property uh, we are discussing here is subject metadata. Uh, it is the topic of content of the resource. Uh, the, best recommend, the best practice, recommended practice, is to select the value from a controlled vocabulary or formal classification schema. Subject metadata is included in almost all metadata schemas, but mostly as the optional, not mandatory ones. And we all know um, manually labeling resources with subject metadata is not efficient and may introduce inconsistency and omission. Another catalog in this study is Research Data Australia. It is a national data catalog and a discovery service provided by LDC. Uh, at the moment, the catalog has uh, about 186K of metadata records of data sets. Um, the records are harvested from about 100 contributors. Uh, contributors are university and uh, research organizations, government agencies, culture and the museums, and so on. And the catalog um, used the subject, mm, subject metadata in our API, OAR, PMH, uh, feed, and also um, in the um, in the discovery port to support browsing by uh, subject um, to uh, include it in the advanced search. It is also used in as a fast filter of uh, search results and used as a fast search. And as a Catalog itself uh, supports uh, several type of uh, subject classification schemas, depends who contribute uh, the metadata record. The schemas can range from uh, general ones to discipline specific ones. Uh, we try to map those terms from discipline specific uh, schemas to uh, general ones, um, specifically the SRIC4. 
um, because it's widely used um, by research sectors here in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, these figures show at the time of this study, we had about 140k uh, metadata record of data set. Uh, only about um, about half of them are labeled with at least one SLOOP4 labels. And the SLOOP4 uh, 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 classification schemas has about 1,400 terms. They are arranged hierarchically in three layers. Uh, the top layer has uh, 22 terms or labels. Uh, they are coded with two digits. <coughs> and, uh, this figure shows uh, the number of records per S uh, per for two digit. That's uh, 22 top layer uh, terms. And um, it's indicated the uneven distribution here. Uh, about 90% of labeled records are from uh, these three categories. And so that's the background. We have about uh, half of all catalog records does not have a S rig for uh, labeling. So how we can improve that situation. So we try to explore the possibility of assign S rig for code to unlabeled record uh, automatically. So for that purpose, we applied a machine learning method to train models. Uh, we compared four supervised machine learning methods and we used uh, the, the, the goal is to uh, labeling um, data with those top layer 22 labels. And uh, we use those data um, uh, with at least uh, SRIC4 uh, labels for training, validation, and uh, testing. And uh, we extract the title and the description description from each record as a representation of that record. Uh, we try to apply the best model and the prediction from the training and the validation to the test data set. So here is the result. Uh, the four models achieved a similar uh, labeling accuracy on the test uh, data set uh, with the multinomial logistic regression um, uh, has the best performance. Uh, it is also the fast ones. If we take a close look of performance per label or categories, uh, there are about one sort of labels uh, highlighted in green. Uh, that achieved 90% uh, um, uh, of accuracy. And there are about one sort of those uh, highlighted in pink achieved accuracy below 50%. The other one third are in between. And they seem a correlation between performance and the number of label data. Uh, those um, performance where uh, have more label <coughs> more label data and um, and also have a good representation of um, good feature representation of that uh, label or categories. And the poor performed one seems does not have good number of labeled data and does not have a good quality and representation 
that can distinguish itself with the rest um, categories. So what we have learned uh, from this study, first, uh, there are a large num larger proportion of records uh, from the catalog uh, that don't have a subject matter data. And uh, second, secondary, those with subject matter data are biased toward a few categories. And uh, thirdly, uh, automatic classification works only for some categories. So um, we are going to explore, continue to explore correlation and seek improvement and try to um, employ other advanced machine learning method as well. And also this um, leads to a discussion. Uh, first, uh, there does not exist a classifier that fits for all text classification tasks or collections. And this leads to a generalization issue. And it's hard for organizations who want to improve subject matter data but don't have a resource to uh, train their classification models. And secondary, uh, the traditional machine learning methods rely on the good quality um, of training data set and the amount of the training data set. Uh, some new technologies, for example, deep learning and the transfer learning may provide a way. For example, for categories that not, uh, don't have a good um, mental for um, labeling data in our catalog, we can train word associations from other catalogs and they have a such resource and then apply the uh, word association invading um, when we train our models. And the third lane, uh, practically, practically, there is a question about how to use uh, machine learning output. Uh, machine learning uh, output, the, uh, they suggest the labels based on pro probability. Uh, human experts may, um, may require to provide feedback and uh, look at a range of suggestions and make decisions. And uh, that feedback may lead to uh, improve the machine learning intelligence and the classification accuracy. So we help the machine learning community to um, train their models and that can in turn help ourselves. Um, that's all uh, I want to say. Um, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, in Xiang Niu, Loan Bromley and Jenny Dunn, uh, their contribution to this study. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Ming Fang. That's great. So, um, okay, so let's move along to our, our last presenter, um, um, who is uh, Asma. So I'll turn it over to you. We'll do that last presentation, then we'll take a quick break. All right, hello everybody. I'm uh, Osmus Ominen from the National Library of Finland. Let's see if I can, if I manage to share my screen. Okay, you should see this now. So um, I will be, yeah, good. I will be giving a short introduction to what we are doing. We are doing automated subject indexing with a tool called ANIF and a service called Finto AI. And um, I'm presenting work done together with my colleagues, Mona Lehtinen and Juha Inkinen. So um, the outline, uh, I'm first going to talk about the development of ANIF and then about the quality of automated subject indexing, then how we do community building, where we have deployed ANIF, and then finally some lessons learned. So about the development of ANIF, um, uh, it started with a realization that we might be able to um, leverage existing metadata 
and use that to help produce more metadata. In particular, there is a, a big discovery service in Finland called Finna, which uh, is basically a search engine for, for uh, materials from archives, libraries and museums. And it has about 15 million records and many of those come with subject metadata. So uh, uh, the idea was to try, to try to use this as training data uh, for machine learning algorithms, but also other data sets as well, not just Finna. And um, in uh, 2017, uh, I created an, a, an early prototype of ANIF. Uh, it was quite quick, quickly um, put together, uh, but uh, it got people excited. So we decided to put more resources into this, this idea. And uh, we started a new implementation in uh, early 2018. And uh, the goals for this was to create a tool that is multilingual, that's independent of the indexing vocabulary. So it's not just um, the, uh, well, we mostly use nowadays the general Finnish ontology for uh, uh, subject description, but it should be uh, able to uh, use this for other vocabularies as well. Uh, it should support different uh, algorithms. So um, it's not just a single algorithm, but more like a framework where you can plug in different uh, algorithms, either statistical or machine learning or rule-based, or, I mean, it's, it, it's agnostic to that, those choices. Um, and it should have a command line interface and a web user interface and a REST API for integration with other systems. And finally, uh, we have a good experience uh, about building open source software and letting also uh, others use it and to build communities. So we wanted to make this community oriented open source. And um, for the algorithms, um, we currently have uh, quite a few of them implemented as backends. And uh, there are basically two main approaches. There's the lexical approach, which is um, basically to match terms in a document to terms in a vocab vocabulary. This is similar to the uh, rule-based approach, but also you can uh, often use some machine learning there as well. And then there's the associative approaches like um, uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, which are more uh, sort of fuzzy, statistical in nature, and that require lots of training data to make inferences about which subjects correlate with which kind of words or expressions in the document. Uh, okay, then um, the next question is, how do we know this is good? How do we evaluate the quality? And this is um, a complex topic, um, but we have done several things in this area and and of course the first obvious thing is to to compare to some kind of a gold standard and now we have collected some existing uh, collections of documents that have already been indexed manually uh, and uh, in um, in three languages are because our um, uh, in, in Finland, uh, the official languages are Finnish and Swedish, and obviously we also have lots of English language materials. So uh, we can measure um, the difference between uh, what the algorithm produces and what human indexes have given, like basically just split to a train set and a test set and, yeah, and calculate, for example, the F1 score. And over time, we have been able to improve this course. So here, the, the gray bars are the original prototype, and then the color, colored ones are more recent uh, iterations. And, but we also done a different kind of assessment where we gave um, uh, evaluators um, proposed subjects for documents and, and let them rate them on a scale of whether it's uh, uh, useful or, uh, or whether it uh, represents what's in the document. And this way we could compare the, um, the output from different algorithms and also can compare them head to head against uh, manual indexing. So we could see here that, uh, that uh, the uh, best, um, uh, at, at the time we did this, this two years ago, the best um, uh, ensemble algorithm, which, which was a combination of, of, of several algorithms, it wasn't as good, obviously, as the manual indexing, but it got pretty close for some documents, especially for uh, master's thesis, for example. Okay, uh, then uh, something about community building. So, um, uh, first of all, we have a website for the ANIF project uh, where you can try it. Um, there is a form where you can just paste in text or type in text, and then you can uh, 
click the blue button and, and get suggestions. This is the uh, description of, of this session uh, we're in today. And I just gave it to Anif and got these sort of suggestions that it could be about automation, machine learning, indexing, and so on. I, I think at least the top ones are pretty accurate, maybe not the, the, the ones near the, towards the bottom. Um, and we also produced together with the ZBW, uh, the Leibniz Information Center for Economics in Germany, we produced a hands-on tutorial, which we originally organized at the SWIB 19 conference in Hamburg. But then after that, uh, because of the pandemic, we uh, turned it over into an online tutorial. So uh, if you got interested in on, if uh, there are some exercises and videos freely available on YouTube and GitHub. And uh, we also uh, did this tutorial at uh, last year's GCMI virtual, and we're going to do it again at uh, SWIB 21 this year. Okay, um, about the deployments of ANIF. Um, um, one of the early ones was the uh, UX repository of the University of Uvascula. And because they have this, um, like many universities, they have a repository where they put documents. And in this case, uh, masters and doctoral thesis are very important. Um, and um, um, at this university, the students upload their thesis when they have completed it. Uh, they, they upload it as a self-service. And um, earlier, they were given just a form uh, with an em empty subject field where they had to type in subjects. Uh, but um, now, thanks to Anif, instead, they get this list of suggestions where they can check those uh, subjects that they think are good. And that's much easier for them. And the same idea has been applied also in other university repositories. Um, and then uh, we also created uh, uh, a service called uh, Finto AI, and this is a website or an API service, if you, if you like, also um, uh, where um, uh, people who do subject indexing can, uh, uh, they can copy and paste text from documents and um, um, get suggestions for subjects uh, for this text. And it has been very re well received. We've been running it since May 2020 in production. And uh, we have also applied this to the uh, process of um, electronic individual deposits, because at the National Library of Finland, we receive uh, deposits from publishers, for example, and also public sector organizations who produce reports and the like. And, um, for these individual deposits, um, there is a web form where the uh, depositor has to uh, basically upload a file and then fill in a form with metadata. And we use uh, the Finto AI service to suggest the subjects so that to make it a little bit easier to, to index these in our databases. Uh, finally, some lessons learned. Uh, well, we've been playing with a lot of algorithms and uh, almost universally, uh, the, <laughs> uh, we have found that um, algorithms, they can be used alone as single algorithms, like in uh, Ming Fang Wu's presentation just before me. But you almost always get a better result if you combine them into an ensemble and, for example, average out the results with um, uh, coming from different types of algorithms. And uh, we've uh, had this process where we start with experimentation and just build up the infrastructure as we go and, and uh, you know, expand it as uh, needed and uh, move slowly towards production. And this has worked very well for us. So now we are in production, but of course, we're still doing improvements also. And uh, when we have created this kind of API service that can be used uh, um, used by, by uh, I mean, regular users who, who use, for example, repository systems. It's, it's, it's quite e easy to implement this uh, when we already have provide the API, but uh, it can be challenging to explain it to users because they, when they get this, um, for example, a list of suggestions coming from an algorithm, they don't necessarily know what to do. What should I do? What should I, you know, is, is this, some uh, absolute truth that they want just want to leave it alone or uh, yeah so so it, it can be a difficult thing to explain uh, but that's it for now and I uh, hope to see you in the uh, panel discussion
Great, thank you, Asma. That 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 was a great presentation. Really, really appreciate that. So there's lots of, lots of food for thought here, and that was our objective in this first section. So. Um, you know, we talked about this in our group, and we decided that um, it, that what we wanted to do before we got into the discussion was to take a five-minute break. Now, there's a danger you're going to wander away in five minutes, but don't go too far. Please come back. Uh, so I'm going to set a timer for um, for five minutes, uh, so you can see that on you'll see that on the screen, um, and uh, and then we'll come back and. Um, and have the um, uh, and have the uh, the, the discussion um, where, whoops. Uh, well, I guess I can you go from here, and have and have the discussion. So uh, you might use this time to uh, jot some notes in the um, in the chat. Um, or think about your questions. Um, but but please think. And um, again, I'll set this timer now and. Please come back in five minutes and we'll see you then. Oops. Okay, um, great. Well, Welcome back from the break, and um, I hope you, um, um, you had a chance to get a glass of water um, and refresh. So, um, like I said, please type your questions into the chat. I'm going to um, turn this presentation off and uh, stop sharing, and go back to the to the panel. Um, okay, so it looks like. Um, It looks like we don't have any, any questions in, in the chat, but there's certainly a lot of grist for the mill that came up in the presentations. So um, I wanted, I know in our, um, we had some discussions earlier and I know that this came up a little bit in the presentations, um, but there was one theme which had to do with the use cases, you know, what the objective of, um, um, of using um, a technology um, was was for um, what the what the end goal was and um, and and whether this is uh, this is different uh, depending upon the type of information that we're working with whether we're working with a data set or we're working with a collection of images or we're working with a collection of documents we um, uh, and, and by documents, I mean text primarily, or we're working with something that's more um, heterogeneous, a combination um, of, of all of that. And I was curious if, um, because uh, one of the uh, ideas of having this variety of, of people was that they represent different domains, um, and we also represent different forms of content and different perspectives um, as well. So I was wondering if anyone um, wanted to Talk a little bit about the the key use cases that they're that they're trying to support. Um, for for example, um, in Osma's presentation, uh, we saw a a, a, a variety of, of goals of, of ANIF, but but basically the idea was to support the automate, uh, automated generation of um, of suggested subject uh, terminology. Um, it it might be um, uh, presented in different forms uh, for and different use and different uh, scenarios, engaging with users. Uh, whereas um, in um, in the in the case of um, of what um, uh, Kim and uh, Quim and Maria Christina were talking about was sort of a more fully automated uh, approach to try to disambiguate uh, images um, and. Um, I think Margie was talking primarily, but I don't want to put words in your in your mouth about um, about text. And, and in Ming Fang's case, we we're talking about uh, being able to uh, generate a uh, subject categorization for data set, which is um, which is different. And um, and Hans, of course, was talking about about images, but concerned with um, nuances a bit like what what 
what Kim and Maria Christina were. So, um, I mean, are there some common things here, or or do we see these as primarily different, as different separate use cases? Anyone want to pick up on on the use cases that seem most most important? I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm answering the correct question, but I'll pick up on it. So uh, um, I think uh, pretty much, well, I don't know if all, but pretty much all, most of the stuff that we, we, we all were talking about here feeds into each other. Um, I can certainly see um, a lot of what was talked about feeding into our, our uh, work. Um, icon class is the most obvious one. Um, we are um, we are working with texts and images, as we said, um, and the main purpose is to generate good metadata as automatically as possible, and also to provide a search, um, a some sort of a search API, some sort of a search service and possibly browsing. Um, this metadata that we generate will, will, um, will include it into Europeana. A lot of our data sets, we, we work with Europeana on this. So it's our partner in, in this project in St. George on a Bike. Um, so we will include our metadata um, in the Europeana, for the Europeana collections for the case that we're studying, which is only the paintings between the 12th and the 18th century. Um, we are not looking at anything else at this point. Some of the techniques that we have are fully transferable um, to other topics or periods, and some of them are not so much transferable. For example, we have a piece that we haven't really touched upon because uh, it's under evaluation which is uh, rule-based, heuristic rules. Um, and we're also starting um, to develop a knowledge graph. So we're not only up, up until now, we're basically almost 100% been looking at, um, let's call it statistical AI bottom up. And um, now we're starting to look a little bit at the top down at the um, symbolic AI. Uh, this is connected to what uh, Marjorie was, was talking about. Um, so we think that there is a need for both. Um, I don't think we, we reach the limit with the bottom-up approaches, uh, especially if we manage to collect a lot of data via crowdsourcing, which is our plan with Mechanical Turk. Uh, but I think there's a good place for... for uh, meeting bottom up and, and, and top down because there's a um, certain type of knowledge that it's impossible to learn via statistical methods. And um, this is where, you know, rules or icon class or anything that has embedded common sense and, and knowledge about the domain is useful. Um, I'm not sure whether I touched upon what you expected to. <laughs> but maybe other people can can take it from here so i i see that we're talking about very related stuff uh maybe me me fang's work is slightly different because it's more numerical but um well i, I think it's it's useful to uh to emphasize that what i've shown um is not necessarily our, um, our own ambitions <laughs> that would be, um, you know, uh, be well, quite arrogant if, if I would say those are our ambitions. Uh, what I wanted to stress is, is basically the level of the, the problems we are facing. Um, um, dealing with images, uh, especially from the Middle Ages and early modern area, but also from the 18th and 19th century, is um, it's, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> Uh, because many of those have deeper meanings and much more complex meanings than, than we normally um, would assume. And the reason I, um, I showed something from the uh, index of medieval art is that 
that is actually focusing on something which iconographically is extremely simple, uh, just a hand gesture, uh, an extended or a raised hand, which literally, that's what I was showing, has been described thousands and thousands of times. So imagine over a hundred years, because that's the age of the index, the catalogers there have identified this little gesture in countless numbers of, of pictures. So my, my um, well, I wouldn't call it my expectation, but my hope would be that at that level of, of identifying uh, a, a, a hand that is stretched forward in a speaking or a commanding gesture, if we can manage um, to automate actually tagging that, imagine how much we can speed up the process of those people in Princeton uh, tagging all those images now manually with words. I mean, if we can suggest, you may not even um, decide for them, but suggest to them, all right, here's, we, we think the algorithm tells us there's a hand raised somewhere in this picture. Click on, con just to confirm that it is there. So to speed up the process, th that would be tremendous results. Um, so what, what maybe looks like very ambitious um, <laughs> or, or maybe arrogant ambitions is just, I, I know from my own experience, that would be extremely helpful. It's much more modest than it may have sounded. No, that, that, uh, that, I think that's an, uh, uh, an excellent observation and a, and a, a goal. Um, I was interested, I mean, Osma mentioned that um, in the ANIF implementation or one of them, they uh, present suggested um, categories and that um, the users uh, didn't always understand how to interpret that and what step they should take. I was wondering, Asma, if you have anything you might like to add about that experience in the context of this idea of, of engaging with the, the community to um, um, you know, present suggestions uh, of a pattern that's been observed that would be relevant, like the the, the gesture that uh, Hans mentions. Yeah, if, if, if I may, right. if I to interrupt um, a, huh? a, an additional question, because I'm, I'm looking at my other screen to uh, at Anif. What type of texts are you actually expecting people to put in there? Mm. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I will try to respond to both. <laughs> so um, first of all, um, I think there's a difference between uh, using a, an algorithm to, to give suggestions that uh, a human then has to assess and maybe choose uh, choose the right one or, or the right ones. And, um, and um, or the alternative, which is just to let the algorithm do its job and, and, and don't interfere and, and just hope that it will produce a good result. And uh, we are mostly doing the former. So, so with Anif, the, uh, so far, the all the applications built around it have been based on the idea that it's producing some suggestions, but uh, there's a human in the loop um, making the final decision. And um, as for the, um, uh, for the challenges explaining this to users, this is mainly because with repository systems like the one I mentioned, uh, they um, many of the users are basically first-time users. They are students who have never done this before. It's their first thesis and quite possibly the last one as well. So they are first-time and last-time users, <laughs> maybe. And and that's that's a different than when you have a, a experienced catalog do this all the time and and you know they they learn they they get the idea quite quickly that okay this is just a suggestion coming from a machine and i can do what i want with this i, I can even throw it away and, and do it myself if, if i don't like the uh, the suggestion but yeah um so um it's a bit of a challenge to explain this in, in simple terms to first time users that that's that was my point Mace, basically um i don't know how that relates to um medieval imagery because uh, we're just dealing with text <laughs> and uh i didn't, don't know if there are any use cases where um first time users are being 
are asked to analyze you know medieval pictures <laughs> maybe that happens somewhere maybe in some crowdsourcing setting um, but no that's well, <laughs> yeah well um a good 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 point there there was um uh, a comment in the chat um I'll, I'll pick up on the second question the second point first uh which was they were wondering what the background of the evaluators were uh asma um that you mentioned uh in your presentation mm -hmm. to sort of evaluate the quality of the of the suggestions that was a slightly different use case right so um that was um that was a workshop we organized two years ago at the library network days which is a big event where uh, basically all the librarians in finland gather to to a conference every two years and uh, and uh so this was a self-selected group all had some sort of a library background or at least closely related like archives or museums and uh, many of them were also professional subject catalogers but not all of them so um that's that's basically it so they they knew a thing or two about subject indexing but mm -hmm. uh it's yeah it was a little bit of a mixed group and self-selected yeah margie i'm, um, I'm wondering yeah. oh, I'm, I'm might, if sorry okay. Oh, yeah. If I may just mention like one thing, uh, I think this is very related to what people call explainable AI. So um, sometimes um, you can be too smart for your own good and recommend something that you know um, looks like oh it looks awesome. You 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 like exactly got this right and this is very specific and refined response and it could be like way off. So I think there's a there's there's a there's a balance um, and uh, sometimes you may be wrong anyway, even if you don't try to be as smart as you can. And I think it's good for, I, I don't know how you do that, but I think it's good for people to understand that this is, uh, this is a way of, um, for them to understand where those results come from and not take them as, as you know, as the truth. Um, and also some recommendations, I mean, there are different kinds of recommendations, right? And they, depending on their recommendation, <clears throat> excuse me, they may be useful for a certain type of user or for a certain type of application um, or, or not. I mean, if we only talk about, um, you know, iconographs or, or historians or, um, I mean, I can I cannot even dare to say that we're ever going to generate something that Hans could. <laughs> I mean, maybe we can we can detect like a raised hand, but we're not gonna. I mean, we have no chance of 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 generating any kind of symbol from that. It's like we we need something top down, and even that. I mean, how do you write so many rules for? That? I mean, um, I think being arrogant in the sense of being ambitious is very good, but I mean, this is definitely not something that we would ever, you know, think that we could do. But uh, I think it's it's good to transmit the message that this is to explain to, to explain where the results come from, so that the user can decide whether this is useful for her, him, or not. Yeah, that's a great point. Ming Fang has her hand up. Um, you should unmute yeah yeah um i guess so the common ground for us we all try to improve the metadata quality for uh, either image te text or data to improve um, um you know search experience or whatever um uh, but caption is much harder than <laughs> labeling um, because that's more subjective. And uh, second, uh, we have a similar situation like uh, Osma. They ask a user explicitly to pick up those uh, keywords, the common keyword. For us, can we, we even, you know, for one sort of labels that achieve 90% of accuracy, we still couldn't apply that model to, to, to the data because um, we don't own this metadata. If we <laughs> attack those uh, um, metadata wrong, with the wrong subject, our um, upstream data providers were, you know, like the student pick up those uh, keywords to say, what do you do to my mental data? So, yeah, um, that, that, that's one I'm trying to make. 
Great, thanks. Margie, I was wondering, you know, this reminds me of, you know, general questions about quality assurance and workflow, which are not necessarily about AI, but are certainly relevant to building applications that are that are practic <laughs> practical applications. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that because you've worked for so long, you know, around publishing and, um, you know, this. If, if we talk about this as being an efficiency, um, and some no one's mentioned this, but the idea that, you know, people are inherently inconsistent and algorithms will tend to drive us towards consistency, which might not be correct, but it, it suggests um, and can help actually provide a more, um, you know, a, a more consistent um, application. The ideal, you know, in the utopia, we do have this feedback loop, which I, I think we're imagining here. Um, but anyway, Margie, I just wonder, I was wondering if you had any thoughts, you know, kind of around this from a practical production perspective, you know? Yeah, I do. Um, it, it, it <laughs> he nods. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that in order to implement automatic indexing or AI processes, you need to be able to prove to the humans that are the consumers that what you're giving them is at least somewhat equal to the quality of the work that they did. Um, and we, we, our first crack at that is always um, against hit, miss, and noise statistics. And that might be against a vetted set like Ozma described, um, where we can programmatically log what the machine suggested and what the humu humans have suggested over time. Um, and we get hit where human suggested it a miss where human suggested it and the machine did not and noise where the machine suggested it and the human uh, would not have. Um, and those statistics change depending on how many of the results you take. So when Osma talked about his results, he said these at the bottom are probably not as relevant. And that's always true. It, so most people put a limit on the number of terms returned. Our default limit is 20, but I would say publishers in general use seven. It's interesting to me that libraries and museums usually only use three um, as the number of terms that they wanna take as a handle. Um, and if you can't prove at least 85% accuracy, that is 85% hits over uh, misses and noise, then uh, your system should not be implemented. It's got too many errors and humans will do far better. So it's not worth the money. Um, and so that's the target that we look for when we implement these things. Um, but the second thing you brought up, Joseph, was um, what I call editorial drift. And we've actually run into trouble. We talked about those vetted sets. So we take those as the gospel. Um, but we found with one client who was actually a medical publisher, so this was serious, that the editorial staff was only 40% consistent in their indexing. We were looking for 85% consistency to launch. And um, <laughs> the uh, editorial director was so insulted that he pulled the plug on the project at that time. But they came back later and said, oh yeah, it's, it's clear we need this. But um, it, it was a bit of a slap in the face because people do, it depends on what you looked at last um, and what you had for lunch and whether you're having troubles at home and all those different kinds of things. So your mind, is embracing a certain cognitive set and our cognitive widths vary. The average person is seven. Um, and if you're a manager, you try to have something that's a little broader. But um, when, when people are balancing all those different variables, then what they use as the index term at hand is gonna be different. So the machine is indeed assist, uh, a good assist to make sure that indexing is over time much more consistent. Asma has his hand up. You want to add something to that or take us in a different direction? Oh, you need to mute, unmute yourself, Asma. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That, that, those were good points. And actually, we also have uh, had uh, the, um, the same issue with um, 
indexer consistency or what you call the editorial drift. So uh, yeah, that's that's certainly the case uh, that when you give two people the same document to index or even the same person, but six months later or just the next day, uh, you might get a different result. And actually we also organized a workshop four years ago uh, uh, where we uh, gave um, the same kind of people that was also also a workshop at the library network days where we gave a room full of people uh, a small set of documents and um, asked them to 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 um, index them with subjects and then we compared and we got a consistency of about 33 percent overall so so uh, okay in this case the, the, the it wasn't an ideal setting because not all of them had a, a, a very deep experience in subject indexing and so on. But still, it was like a, you know, a, a mind-blowing result because you realize that this isn't really just about. You can never achieve a, a accuracy like eighty percent or eighty-five that you mentioned. It's it's just impossible when you have a big vocabulary, lots of uh, terms to select from, and you only need to pick a few. And uh, I mean, uh, there are so many overlapping uh, rules for how to do this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just impossible to get um, that level of consistency. But um, that also gives a nice baseline to aim for. So if you have uh, like 33% or 40% or even in some cases up to 50% consistency between humans, then you know that uh, an algorithm that can achieve something like 40% or 45% uh, F1 score compared to the human indexing is actually can be pretty good. Uh, although it doesn't mean that it's necessarily good because algorithms, they make their mistakes are different from what uh, humans make. I mean, when, when you give two uh, subject indexers the same document and they produce two sets of subjects and only 50% of them are the same, that doesn't mean that the other ones are bad. They are just different. I mean, it might, might be a matter of perspective. But uh, if, you get, if you let an algorithm give a suggestion and it's also 50% the same as, as those, what those humans give, the other half can be just complete garbage, something that a human would never, never suggest. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, a good, it's, it's, it's a good baseline to aim against, but it's not the final result. Uh, um, you, you still have to be aware that algorithms can sometimes be really, really stupid. And uh, that's why we are doing the, the, the exercise with uh, humans rating the suggested subjects, because it's, it's a different way of evaluating and you catch these sort of problems. Yeah, we have a couple of hands raised. Um, Margie, I'm gonna call on you because you're unmuted. And if I don't call on you, you'll talk. <laughs> First, then Maria Christina. Um, so uh, I would say that a lot of these systems can be used in an assisted mode. Um, so instead of trying to completely replace the human, what you do is speed their activity. And we, we have found speeding at, a, at least sevenfold is pretty common. And because most of our, most of our customers are uh, learned societies or, or uh, learned publishers, as well as quite a few corporations, then those people are freed up to do other things. Um, and we do have a number of people that use it in a fully automated mode, like the IEEE and JSTOR and um, DuPont and folks like that. But it it does move uh, it does move the data much more quickly. And what they do in the fully automated mode is they sample the data. So the combination of sampling or human assisted seems at this point to be a good sweet spot. So Maria, Christina. Yeah, I, I, um, I fully agree. And then I, as I said, we're trying to automate as much as we can, but we are absolutely aware that um, without extensive training and human, you know, annotation and there's no way we can so we do we don't see this as a replacement but um so i i fully agree with marjorie but this is not what i wanted to say i forgot what i wanted to say yes i remember so what i wanted to say is uh we're not uh, maybe maybe I, I didn't understand exactly like we're saying 85 percent okay so 
how was this evaluated? Is the, is the person looking at the automated things and say, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is so-so? Or are we looking at applying some of these, you know, clip spice, F whatever, meteor, blue, rouge, whatever scores? Like how, how is this? We are at the, well, one of the <laughs> points and that we are at in, in St. George is exactly this one. How do we evaluate? And what is useful? Uh, maybe maybe something is useful, even if it's not, but like, how do you, what's the best way to measure it? And I don't think there's a best way. What are the ways to measure? How do you, how do you navigate this? So uh, I would be very happy to learn from you guys because we're at this point and we don't know what the best thing to do is. Margie, you wanted to respond? Yeah, oh. to me, there are two main ways to evaluate the stuff. One is programmatic and the other is using people. So using people is expensive and time consuming, um, which is your whole point. But it, the programmatic way means that you have to have a training set or a previously indexed set um, that you know is really correct. So you would, you would look at the data is to those hits, what a human suggests, you got to match a miss where, where the computer did not give you that information. And then the noise, but the problem with the noise is that it's not, um, it's not what the people suggested, but it might be totally accurate. So you have relevant and irrelevant noise. And that's the problem with, if, if you take a, a set of data that's been then indexed, I think it was Ted that said over the last hundred years, well, there's going to be a lot of editorial drift in that hundred years. And so if you use it as a totally, um, a, a totally pure set, you're going to end up with a bit of a mess. But if you um, do maybe have a smaller set that you can benchmark against, then you can do it programmatically. You can say, here's what it was in the in the um, uh, human index set, and here's what it is by computer, and then you can compare those two things. And that gives you um, a fast way to anal analyze it. Otherwise, you need to probably sample, um, and you need to take a set that's big enough that the vendor or the person trying to present the system to you is not going to have handcrafted the results. That's one of the problems that people have. They get a handcrafted theoretically automatic resultant set um, and it's not really so if you say you have to you have to run at least 5,000 records through this automated system because that's bigger than most people are going to do by hand you can take a hundred thousand I don't care because it's programmatic and then you just take a sample you say every 50th every 20th every hundredth item and look at those um, personally and see how yeah how well the, the problem that we I'm sorry. The problem that we have, for example, is that, uh, well, there's a bigger problem, than, but there's also a smaller problem. <laughs> it's a subset of the first one. The bigger problem is that we're trying to generate captions. Okay. And uh, so I think it's very hard to, to match. I mean, you can say the same thing in many ways. So if you have a set of labels that says, um, I don't know, um, chloride, uh, you know, uh, nitrogens, and I don't know, then maybe you're able to have an exact match or to have some sort of, a, you know, hyponym, hypernym, whatever match. But if you have uh, phrases, then that's a lot harder to do. Um, are, are, you, are, are you trying to generate these captions from something that's already associated with the image or are you trying to discover them in the image? Discover them. Discover label automatically as much as we can. Discover the, the objects in an image. Try to do as good of a job as we can and we're working on improving that for the relationships between the objects and then say something. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't sound like a natural language, but at least, at least give triples, you know, like uh, man rides horse, okay? And maybe the painting is um, knights, um, 
rides horse or um, St. George, um, whatever. So there's not always a best way to, to I mean, I, I don't, I'm not asking you to solve our problems now. I was just saying that I think this, this no, is. But there are two, um, two programs that come to mind. One of them is, is SciGen, um, which yeah, we're use, yeah, we're automatically using builds an abstract for you. GPT-3 has been bought by uh, Microsoft and they're not, they're not letting anybody play with it right now. But, um, and that's probably good for the publishing industry, I have to say, because uh, programmatically generated papers are a problem for them. But for you, they're a good they're a good project. And the other is a, a metadata, a meta titles project that's um, I'm working on with the American Society for Clinical Oncology. So it has to do with medical images, which are a bit different than the images that you're dealing with, but, but there are a lot of similarities in the um, algorithms that you guys outlined um, in your talk. So I'd be happy to talk with you more about that offline, but the, but the options are, um, they're, they're out there. Auto, automatic summarization is another one, but automatic summarization goes from full text. And there was a really good paper by um, Bierman. What's his first? David. Thank maybe, you. maybe we should take this. Yeah, you might Marjorie. Take it, take yeah, it <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But look yeah, at the so, paper uh, by uh, David Beerman at NCOS uh, in our who's, which yeah. focuses on your problem as well. Yeah, and um, the natural language generation is a is a whole other area um, that you know that can be a whole section. Hans, it sounded it looked like you were about to say something. Yeah, well, the 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 whole concept of of a correct description of an image. I'm, I'm sorry, but that doesn't that doesn't hold water. Yeah. Um, you, you can have uh, dozens of of correct descriptions of an image uh, from the Middle Ages or the early modern or whatever area, and then um, like they have at the index of medieval art, and then there's this musicologist who is searching for images of musical instruments. And you haven't mentioned them, or you have used the incorrect or uh, a more generic word for it, and then you have a problem. There, there is no, I, I, as you will remember, Joseph, when we were in, in the early '90s, we had these workshops on icon class, and then we have some some pictures on the table with six or seven people who were doing this all the time. They they were describing images all the time, and 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 they were applying a single classification to those images and they were they were well you couldn't call them consistent they were all very different because it depends on your bias your domain that's one of the questions I wanted to ask Osma is there, is there a possibility to restrict uh, the interpretation that is offered by your suggestions yeah. to a certain domain because completely unrelated to anything I can class or whatever is something I did in, 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 or I didn't do it in Rotterdam, but the programmer who worked with us in, in Rotterdam library, um, he, he sort of implemented something that is similar to ANIF, but very restricted to the domain of economy. So what he, 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 was, he was using just one classification, the gel classification, and he was using the abstracts of a lot of articles, thousands of articles about economy. And his results were, were impressive. Um, and I've, I've tried just tried some, some of those uh, 16th century translations of Erasmus in Anif just now. And then, yeah, some of the, it's, it's exactly as you said, uh, some of the suggestions are very relevant, but half or three quarters of them are just ludicrous because they don't have any, the domain is too, to diffuse, you, you just don't understand what's the relationship with the text I've I've shown to the system and the response from it because it it is, doesn't it is not restricted to a certain domain. Yeah. So now that we've now that we've opened up this can of worms or this Pandora's box, <laughs> we we can see I we're actually out of time. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've we've um, we have to and do we're this only just, and we're only just getting getting warmed up. Thank <laughs> you.
So, um, and that's actually a great a great segue. Um, I just want to um, uh, go back to one more slide. And first, I, I want to thank everyone for uh, staying with us and for getting engaged in this in this lovely discussion. Um, but I, I just want to put up one last slide with everybody's email address. There's a lot of things um, to discuss here. Um, we've only just begun. Now is when we would actually go to have lunch or go to the bar and continue the discussion. But I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in this discussion and for making their presentations as well as uh, the people in the chat. Um, we're, we're at time, uh, but the conversation's just begun. I hope we can continue having uh, robust discussions about these really interesting topics. So thank you very much, everyone who presented and everyone who, um, who participated. And um, uh, please uh, come to um, Dublin Core meetings and um, engage in discussions like this um, in the future. So thank you all so much. And um, have a wonderful uh, week. And um, I appreciate all your all your help. So have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.